Tonight, the holiday travel rush. 137 million Americans hitting the roads and taking to the skies this weekend. Air travel expected to hit pre-pandemic levels. But can cancellation-plagued airlines keep up with the surge? Plus, soaring temperatures fueling massive blazes out west. Firefighters rush to the hospital with heat-related illnesses. The record-shattering heat not letting up as storms take aim at the East Coast. We'll bring you the full Labor Day forecast in moments. Trump's Mar-a-Lago stash. The full inventory of documents seized by the DOJ just released. Nearly 50 folders that were marked classified found empty. Tonight, growing questions about what happened to the documents that were inside. Assassination attempt. The shocking moment in Argentina, a man pointing a gun at the vice president's head at point blank range. The weapon jamming as he pulled the trigger. But we're now learning about the suspect in custody after police raided his home. Disturbing new body camera footage from Los Angeles. Police shooting a man in the back as he ran away after one of the officers was heard saying it's not a gun. What police say they found at the scene that they may have mistook for a weapon. Plus, shady business. A small town in Florida banning umbrellas and tents on the beach, handing out fines and citations to beachgoers who refuse to comply. Now, some residents are now fighting back in court. And crash and grab, an SUV plowing through the front of a sporting goods store, a second location targeted just miles away. The suspects opening fire once they made it inside. What police say they were trying to get their hands on. Top story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Gabe Gutierrez in for Tom. Tonight, millions of Americans heading out to enjoy the long holiday weekend. But after a summer of travel chaos, anxiety levels are high. Nearly 13 million travelers expected to flood airports across the country. The surge, the latest test for an industry marred by mass cancellations all summer. So far, just over 400 flights canceled. For those taking to the roads, instead, a glimmer of good news this Labor Day weekend. A gallon of gas now just $3.80, the lowest average price since March. But anyone traveling west will be met with record-breaking heat that's also fueling massive wildfires. A border fire now burning more than 5,000 acres. Miguel Almaguer is in Los Angeles and leads us off tonight. From Philly to Chicago to Los Angeles, tonight no holiday for some of the nearly 13 million Americans flying over the Labor Day weekend. With all these people, hopefully I you know, stay calm and cool. With some of the nation's biggest airports seeing their largest holiday crowds today, August was a month of misery, nearly a quarter of all flights delayed. I'd rather do an early flight than get here and be in the middle of all the rush. While airlines are looking to rebound after a summer of cancellations, the vast majority of Americans will travel by car this weekend. Gas prices falling for two and a half months, now 3.80 a gallon, but the national average still 20% higher than a year ago. Taking a road trip is still the most economical mode of transportation, even with the higher gas prices. As many remain eager to get away, for 48 million, there's no escape from the historic heat. Tonight, the Golden State red hot in more ways than one. Oh my God. Evacuations now underway in Northern California as yet another fire explodes, this one threatening the town of Weed. Cities like Los Angeles, emergency calls are pouring in. Yesterday alone, LAFD responded to 227 calls above their daily average. Many of those heat related. And now, more record triple digit heat across states like Nevada, Utah, Montana, and Wyoming. We're seeing it affect more than just the usual elderly and the young. It's a, it will affect the general population due to how prolonged it is. Tonight, tens of millions of Americans feeling the heat and on the move. A holiday for the record books. And Miguel Almaguer joins us now from Los Angeles. And Miguel, I know there's a lot of concern about the power grid, partly because of this brutal heat wave taking just so long, nearly a week now, right? 
That's right, Gabe, and it's going to be sweltering through the weekend. We're expecting 50 cities to break records in 10 different states. And as for the power grid here in California, they're asking residents again to conserve power just to avoid those rolling blackouts. Gabe. Miguel Almaguer, thank you. For more on the brutal heat heading into this holiday weekend, I want to bring in NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman now. Michelle, how high will these temperatures get? Hey there, Gabe. Great to see you. We're going to see temperatures well into the triple digits, some temperatures near 110, Death Valley 125. If they make it to 126, that's going to be the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth in the month of September. So 48 million Americans out west under some sort of heat alert, whether it's a heat advisory or an excessive heat warning, Sacramento, Fresno, Los Angeles, San Diego, into Las Vegas, we are looking at temperatures into the 90s, into the triple digits. It's all due to this heat dome, this area of high pressure, literally a heat pump pumping in this hot air. We're closing off that cooler air from Canada. So it's going to stay in place for a while. It's anchored in place, and we're not going to budge this out of here until next week. As a result, we're going to see temperatures soaring over the next few days. We're going to break records, like Miguel said, uh, record-breaking temperatures in 50 states, 50 cities and 10 states. Okay? And, and, Michelle, I know you've been tracking the tropics all week. What's the latest on this new hurricane? I know, yeah, we have finally have a hurricane in the Atlantic. It's been so long. We went all of August without seeing a hurricane. But we're seeing Hurricane uh, Danielle. We'll get to those graphics in just a minute. It's kind of churning out in the Atlantic. It's so far out. It's so, so far north. So the biggest noteworthy uh, mark on Danielle is that it's a hurricane. We're looking at 75-mile-per-hour winds. It's nearly stationary. It's wobbling out in the Atlantic. But look what happens as we kind of go out the next few days. It doesn't go very far, right? So as we go towards Tuesday, still a Category 1 storm still out really in the middle of nowhere. It does not have its eyes set on the U.S. It has its eyes set on Europe. So nothing to worry in terms of the U.S. mainland, uh, but still noteworthy because we finally have a hurricane for this Atlantic hurricane season. Michelle Grossman, thank you. To Washington now and the new court filing revealing more of what FBI agents found during their search of former President Trump's Florida home last month. Nearly 50 empty folders marked classified were recovered raising new questions about whether those documents are still missing. Senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has the latest. Unsealed by the court today, this detailed property list raises new questions about what happened to classified records at Mar-a-Lago. 48 folders with classified markings inside the former president's office and storage area were empty when the FBI searched. Another 42 empty folders indicated the contents had to be returned to a military aide. Where are the government secrets that might have been inside? Unknown. The FBI did seize 103 classified records up to top secret level found inside the office and storage room. The inventory notes the highly restricted documents had been mixed in with ordinary things, magazines, gifts, and clothing. For the first time, the Department of Justice revealed that more than 11,000 unclassified, government-owned papers and photographs were also seized. Mr. Trump's spokesman responded, this unprecedented and unnecessary raid was not some surgical confined search and retrieval, but a smash and grab. However, today, former Trump Attorney General William Barr defended the DOJ's actions. People say this was unprecedented. Well, it's also unprecedented for a president to take all this classified information and put him in a country club. Donald Trump's actions contributed to the dire warnings from President Biden last night in Philadelphia about dangers to democracy. MAGA Republicans do not respect the Constitution. Republicans rejected that as an unfair, broad attack on Trump voters. They do want to make America great again. They just don't agree with President Biden's neo-socialist woke agenda. But today, the president said he thinks most Trump supporters do not support dangerous ideas. They weren't voting for attacking the Capitol. They weren't voting for overruling the election. They were voting for a philosophy he put forward. And Kelly O'Donnell joins us now from the White House. Kelly, President Trump is now expected to hold his first public rally since the Mar-a-Lago search tomorrow. That's right. He'll be going to Pennsylvania, and that will be key because we've seen in the past how the former president, when he's in front of a big audience of his supporters, will often bring some of his social media posts to life. And in the three weeks since that FBI search of his home, he's been talking about 
what he believes is uh, being persecuted by the Justice Department, claims that he had declassified all those materials, although there's no evidence or record of that, and his lawyers haven't brought that forward. So I would expect that while he is there to campaign for some of his MAGA candidates for Senate and governor, that he will also likely talk about these events and try to get his supporters on his side and to spin his own sort of explanation for what has transpired here. That will make it of interest to Trump's supporters and certainly for the government who is working on this case to see if he says anything that might have evidentiary value as well. Gabe? Kelly O'Donnell, thank you. Now to the economy and the Bureau of Labor Statistics saying 315,000 jobs were added in August, that number down from 526,000 in July. The unemployment rate also ticking up slightly from its lowest point in 50 years in July, now sitting at 3.7 percent. I want to bring in Kristen Myers now. She's the editor-in-chief of The Balance. And uh, Kristen, what does this job report tell us about the health of the economy? Yeah, so while we did see those jobs numbers ticking down from that really blockbuster jobs report that we had in July, the state of the U.S. economy is still really strong. In fact, this jobs report really coming pretty much bang in line with expectations, which, of course, raises the concerns and the fears that a lot of investors particularly have that the Federal Reserve at the end of September is going to decide to hike interest rates yet again. By how much, that of course remains to be seen, but a lot of folks are anticipating right now, I was checking out the uh, yeah. Fed Fund's future rate, what they were anticipating. Markets are still saying 56% chance right now that we're going to see a jumbo rate hike of 75 basis points. Yeah, and you know, there, you still hear that certain industries are you know, employers in certain industries like food service say that they can't find workers, right? So where are these workers being hired? What industries? Well, leisure and hospitality is absolutely one. And so I'm not too surprised to hear that employers are saying, hey, we can't find workers right now. We're also seeing healthcare, retail and professional and business services right now also really uh, boosting the employment the most right now in the economy. So gas prices have also continued to fall. Uh, the average now around $3.81 a gallon. So what do you think this means for the Labor Day weekend, a big driving holiday? Do you think that the decline in gas prices will mean that consumers might start spending elsewhere now? Well, it's a gift right now that we have $3.81 a gallon. This is honestly a gift for a lot of drivers that are going to be out there, a lot of travelers that are definitely going to hit the roads. Because what we have seen over the last couple of months and from a lot of the consumer price indexes, which is tracking inflation, consumers were really staying away from the gas pump because, frankly, it was just far too expensive with gas up over $5 a gallon for the national average. And so I think that a lot of consumers are going to say, hey, we're willing to go back to the gas pump. We're willing to get back into the car. We're willing to start traveling again. But when it comes to spending, I have to say, we have seen consumers continue to spend throughout this entire pandemic, even with inflation hitting those 40-year highs. I don't see that trend stopping anytime soon. Kristen Myers, editor-in-chief of The Balance. Thanks so much for joining us here on set for Top Story. Yes. Kristen, thank you. Next in Mississippi. With a water crisis now in its fifth day, the state is struggling to keep up with the demand for bottled water. The head of FEMA arriving in Jackson today to assess the water emergency. Morgan Chesky is there. In Jackson, this now a frustrating part of the daily routine. It's really affecting us pretty badly. That's why we're stocking up on water. In barely 24 hours, the state says it's handed out more than 500 pallets of water. Nearly all loaded in cars Thank you. for those lucky enough to have one. This Jackson resident trying to get enough water for the weekend, stressing this problem isn't new. You haven't trusted the water coming out of your faucet for, for how long now? 25 years. 25 years. Today at the beleaguered treatment plant, though the water itself is still not safe, a temporary pump is helping restore pressure. A slight improvement officials warn could create a potential new problem. As they're able to increase the pressure at the plant to levels that it has not seen in many years, uh, the challenge then becomes whether we have pipes that rush, rupture uh, across the city. I mean, it's hard. It's hard on everybody. At Bravo Italian Restaurant, the five-gallon jugs disappear just as fast as they come in. The business paying for bottled water to stay open after no water pressure shut them down all week. 
Was my heart incredibly heavy when I looked at my staff and had to send them home? Absolutely it was. And to look at them and say, you can't work today, and I know you need to, it's very disappointing. For now, they work. Knowing what comes out of a faucet here is anything but guaranteed. And amid the constant struggle of trying to get this water treatment plant back online, providing fresh water, yet another struggle headed this way. More rain in the forecast for this weekend, which could only complicate matters for city officials. We'll send it back to you. Warren Chesky, thank you. Now to the investigation into a police-involved shooting in Los Angeles. Body camera footage showing an officer shooting an unarmed man that they said initially was armed. Video shows an officer approaching the man, then acknowledging he did not have a gun before firing at him. NBC's Stephen Romo reports. Tonight, outrage after the release of this police body cam video out of Los Angeles. Take your hands out of your pocket, bro. Take your hands out of your pocket. The footage showing the moment two officers from the Los Angeles Police Department shoot a black man just seconds after one of the officers says the man was unarmed. Police say they were responding to a radio call about an assault with a deadly weapon on July 18th, reporting the suspect allegedly was carrying a semi-automatic firearm. He's black with dreadlocks. He looks like he's a uh, transient. Okay. And uh, I told him to leave and he pulled out a gun. Is it was a black, uh, looked like a black semi-automatic gun. The LAPD releasing videos and audio from the incident. The man, later identified as 39-year-old Jermaine Petit, was shot after police say he did not respond to their verbal commands. Hey, take your hands out of your pocket, bro. Police say that as officers pursued him on foot, he pointed a black metallic object that they believed was a firearm. Shots fired off. Paramedics arrived on scene and took Petit to a local hospital where he remains in stable condition, according to police. Petit's daughter telling NBC News that her father is a military veteran who suffers from PTSD. An LAPD spokesman initially told NBC Los Angeles reporters the night of the shooting that he was armed, but police walked that back after releasing the video. The LAPD says investigators recovered a car part, a six-inch black metal latch actuator, but no weapon at the scene. The LAPD says Petit was arrested for two prior felony warrants. This shooting marked the 20th for LAPD officers in 2022. We continue to see officers use deadly force as a first resort rather than a last resort as we're taught and trained. Cheryl Dorsey, a retired LAPD sergeant who served for 20 years, says she's bothered by what she sees in that video. I see problems with the tactics that the officers used when they engaged and encountered this young man. Now, the LAPD says it is still reviewing this case, and this type of investigation can take about a year. As the body cam footage continues to garner more and more attention, so do questions about the incident and why police, even after noticing he was unarmed, still fired their guns. Hey, drop it! Disturbing video right there. Stephen Romo joins us now on set. And Stephen, we briefly heard in your report that you were able to get in touch with Petit's daughter. What more is she telling you tonight? Yeah, Gabe, she's telling us that she really wants people to know her dad is a loving man who's battling mental health issues. She also wants justice for him and wants the officers held accountable for that shooting in the video. She's also upset that it took a month and a half for that video to actually come out. And she says right now she still can't bring herself to actually watch it, but she is glad that it's out there. Stephen Romo, thanks for joining us here on Top Story. Heading overseas now into the terrifying assassination attempt caught on camera in Argentina. A man putting a gun to the head of that country's vice president, but the weapon jamming when he pulled the trigger. Here's NBC's Kerry Sanders. Argentina's Vice President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner arriving home in Buenos Aires, supporters cheering when a hand holding a gun extends from the crowd. Another angle shows seemingly the first to spot the gun, Kirchner herself. You can even hear the trigger click. But incredibly, police say the gun, loaded with five 38 caliber rounds, jammed. 
The nearby crowd, along with Kirshner's security detail, then turns, chasing the gunman, who is in custody tonight. Police say Fernando Andres Sabag Montiel is Brazilian, but has been living in Argentina at least 10 years. No motive has been revealed. <laughs> This afternoon, thousands gathering to show their support for Kirshner, a popular and polarizing former president, first lady, and senator. This stunning attempt on her life comes on the heels of the assassination of Japan's former prime minister, Abe, who was shot and killed at a campaign rally in July. Today, the vice president was seen leaving her home, waving to supporters. In a speech to the nation, Argentina's president calling to banish the violence and hate from the political and media discourse and from our life in society. Vice President Kirchner has an almost cult-like following in Argentina, much like Eva Perón. Her bravery is tonight endearing her to some of her harshest critics. Carrie Sanders, thank you. Still ahead tonight, the urgent search for a kidnapped jogger. A Tennessee teacher pulled into an SUV while out for a run. The new image released by police. Plus the announcement from, an, from actress Jane Fonda, what the beloved star just revealed about her health. Stay with us. Back now with a possible abduction in Tennessee. Police now searching for a woman they say was out jogging when she was pulled into an SUV. Aaron McLaughlin has the latest. A desperate search for an American school teacher kidnapped in Memphis. And after we actually found information and saw a video where somebody was abducted, then that's going to raise the alarm. Police releasing this surveillance still of 34-year-old Eliza Fletcher jogging near the University of Memphis campus. University police say that around 4.30 Friday morning, the avid jogger was forced into this dark SUV following a brief struggle with an unknown man. After further investigation, we found video that did show a black SUV pull into the area across the street here where uh, the victim was taken. Memphis police now working with the FBI and pleading with the public for help, saying Fletcher's five foot six inches tall, 137 pounds, with blonde hair and green eyes. Last seen wearing a pink jogging top and blue running shorts. Very important that if anybody knows the whereabouts of Miss Fletcher to contact the police immediately. According to University Police, Fletcher regularly runs along Central Avenue, where the kidnapping took place. Her cell phone and water bottle later discovered in front of a house owned by the university. According to local reports, the school teacher, also known as Liza, is a married mother of two from a well-known Memphis family known for its philanthropy. Now she's missing, and the Memphis community on edge. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News. And coming up next, the crash and grab attempts. Cars ramming through the front doors of two separate sporting goods stores where police say they were trying to steal. Stay with us. We're back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the major announcement from the Department of Veterans Affairs. The VA says its medical facilities will provide abortions if the mother or baby's life is at risk or in cases of rape and incest. The procedures will be offered at all facilities, including in states where abortions are banned. It's the first time in history that the department has provided abortions. Next to the suspects wanted for two wild attempted robberies caught on camera. Surveillance video shows the moment a stolen SUV crashes through a sporting goods store in Illinois. The suspects then begin firing at a glass gun case in an attempt to break in, but they were not successful. Authorities say the duo then crashed into another store with a different car just an hour later. No items were stolen in either incident. A consumer alert, a popular company, Up a Baby, is recalling more than 14,000 strollers after a child was injured. The voluntary recall involves all versions of the Up a Baby All Terrain Ridge Jogging Strollers. Strollers were sold from October of last year until last month. The company says a child's finger was severed in a brake disc. Customers can contact Up a Baby for a free replacement of that part. And Actress Jane Fonda revealing a health battle late today. The Oscar winner writing in an Instagram post that she has been diagnosed 
with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and is undergoing chemotherapy. However, the 84-year-old told her fans she will not let the diagnosis slow down her activism. And we wish her well. Now to the Americas. As we've been reporting, Texas Governor Greg Abbott is sending buses of migrants to so-called sanctuary cities across the country. And CNBC's Perry Russum spoke to one father about his grueling journey all the way from Venezuela. In the crowd of migrants bus to Chicago, three-year-old Catalia is the youngest. Her fascination with the watch covers the exhaustion of her two-month journey from Venezuela. Her father, Elliot, lists the countries they walked through to reach the American border. From Venezuela, they went to Colombia, then Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico, a continent-crossing journey wearing down the feet of his pregnant wife. Catalia wants to show us the bottom of her feet, too. We ask Elier, why America? It is simply a country that offers many life opportunities, he says. Elier tells us in Venezuela there is no food, no work, and the country is in political crisis. The UN Refugee Agency reports there are more than 6 million Venezuelan refugees and migrants globally, making it the second largest external displacement crisis in the world. Around Elier's wrist, a barcode bracelet from the border with his age, sex, and home country. A spokesperson for Texas Governor Greg Abbott compares the bracelets to a plane ticket. Elier carries a clear bag holding his family's documents, donated diapers, and a T-shirt. There are MREs, meals ready to eat, and medication for his wife. A Chicago police officer tells us there was no heads up the migrants were being sent here. Baltazar Enriquez shows up to help in his pajamas. We, we're ready. We've been ready for this. Enriquez is with Little Village Community Council in Chicago. The group started in the 60s, primarily helping Czechoslovakian immigrants, now helping migrants from Latin American and South American countries. It's a culture shock, you know, to see these big buildings, all this traffic. A lot of them come from rural areas that they've never even seen a big building like this. There is hope in their tired eyes. They have a meal and another bus ride to a shelter, a temporary home in a country where they want to stay forever. Governor Abbott has sent migrants now to D.C., New York City, and Chicago. He has moved thousands of people since April. He says this is to relieve the pressure on border towns that he says are overwhelmed. Back to you. CNBC's Perry Russum, thank you. Now for more on the growing Venezuelan refugee crisis, I want to turn to Steve Cook. He's the director of medical, uh, medical teams international in Colombia and joins us now from Bogota. Steve, we just saw in that piece many of the migrants coming into the U.S. are Venezuelan natives now. And last year, the U.N. asked other members for nearly $2 billion in aid to support those refugees across Latin America. Now, you often see these folks at the beginning of their journey. How are they doing by the time they make it to Colombia? Great. Thank you, Gabe, for having me here. Uh, it's true, this crisis has been going on for a really long time, and the resources required to support it are, 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 are immense. Um, as people arrive into Colombia from Venezuela, often they're arriving on foot uh, through unofficial or illegal crossings at the moment because the borders have been closed for a long time now. Um, and these unofficial crossings mean that it's quite dangerous to cross into Colombia. People end up coming with very little belongings, very little money, and uh, often have, uh, don't have the documentations they need to uh, enter legally into Colombia as well. This puts them in all sorts of vulnerable situations. And medical teams are seeing all demographics crossing the border mm -hmm. still over the last few years, even when the borders have officially been shut, um, from pregnant women, families with young children to unaccompanied minors. Mm. Um, and many of these people have been out without health care for years now. Um, mm. They're arriving in, in Colombia with all sorts of uh, medical needs, both for short-term illnesses, for long-term illnesses, and even uh, pregnant women who have not had any kind of prenatal care or any kind of checks with a doctor before. Yeah, and Steve, to that point, you know, 6.8 million Venezuelans have left the country since the economic crisis there took hold in 2014, and that's an exodus that rivals Ukraine's, frankly. You know, over 2 million people are in Colombia right now. Is the country equipped to provide the resources many of these refugees need when they decide to stay, especially as the country bounces back from the pandemic. Right, yes. 
In reality, Colombia has been an incredibly welcoming neighbor to, to Venezuelans. Um, there has been a whole lot of level, a great level of support from, um, from regular citizens to church groups and organizations. Um, but the need is way beyond what Colombia can really manage. This is a country that is coming out of, out of its own decades, really, of civil conflict um, with, uh, with thousands, tens of thousands of people still suffering from poverty um, without access to the services that they, need, that they need. So add the COVID-19 pandemic to that, that the health system was stretched way beyond what was what was really, uh, really capable for it. Um, although the government and the healthcare actors has done as much as they could, um, this is why organisations like medical teams are here because we we don't want to see the healthcare system collapse. We don't need that those other services that are so important, not only for Colombians, uh, sorry for Venezuelan migrants, but for Colombians as well. We need to support those services to 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 absorb these uh, 2.5 million migrants into the country over the last few years. Um, thankfully, medical teams, other humanitarian actors like, like us, we've been able to support a lot of different programs, um, you know, particularly with the pandemic, uh, whether it be uh, COVID testing, access to vaccines, other life-saving care. But the, the need is way beyond our capabilities, and that's why Colombia and other countries in the region really need the ongoing support from the international community to fill the gap that we see in the response to this crisis. Steve Cook, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the deadly explosion rocking a crowded mosque in Afghanistan. Taliban officials say the blast went off in the city of Herat during noon prayers today. At least 18 people killed, including an influential cleric with ties to the Taliban. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack, though. Now to the flooding in Mexico, forcing residents to evacuate. New drone video showing the Sabinas River overflowing, sending floodwaters rushing through the streets. Homes and buildings partially submerged. Some locals now packing up belongings to escape the floods. So far, no deaths have been reported. And Queen Elizabeth pulling out of another big royal engagement. The 96-year-old monarch will miss the Braemar Highland gathering in Scotland on Saturday for the first time in her 70-year reign. Buckingham Palace saying the decision was made for the Queen's comfort. It comes amid a string of events she's had to miss for health and mobility reasons. And now, an exclusive look inside a program hoping to change communication around the world. A division of SpaceX called Starlink is working to bring Internet access to areas where crucial connectivity is unavailable. Cal Perry reports. What, about 15 miles? Yes, to a spot where you can actually get service on your phone. Jackie Toledo and Pat Gibson are raising three generations of children here on the edge of Navajo Nation in rural New Mexico. In a place where households are separated by miles of desert and ancient cliffs, Starlink is the only option for communication here. And the, the jet pack didn't really help to... So was, this is then the thing that's worked? Yes, yes definitely. Is. That thing is one of 650,000 terminals in 40 countries around the world communicating with Starlink's growing army of satellites above us all in low Earth orbit. For the last three years, Starlink, a department inside SpaceX, has been hitching a ride from the Falcon 9 rocket launching from Florida and California. And lift off. Here's off here. Here's off. Lauren Dreyer and Bianca Reinhardt are two of the few hundred employees working inside Starlink. It's education, telehealth, communication. Something all too easy to understand in a place like Ukraine, when traditional ground-based communication systems were some of the first targets by Russian airstrike. We had, thankfully, a team on the ground in Europe both Tesla employees, SpaceX employees, that set up an almost instantaneous supply chain to get some terminals that we already had in Europe into Ukraine in about 48 hours. So one of the most impactful moments for me, there's a, a video on Reddit, I think shot by Ukrainian witness. There are hundreds of people gathered around a single Starlink terminal calling and FaceTiming. Business questions arise about the speed in some places and the steep price tag. It's $600 up front for the unit. $110 per month is the current subscription price. And how do you solve some of these problems? Speed and cost. I think we're constantly launching more satellites. I think we as a company have a track record of constantly trying to drive costs down. The Cuba Independent School District in New Mexico used COVID relief money to provide Starlink to their 400 households and 700 students. 
The funding lasts until 2024, but after that, the district and the students are on their own. Something that would leave hundreds of children back where they started before the pandemic, isolated and behind. We would give kids books. Why wouldn't we give them internet connection? Why wouldn't we see that as an equalizer for students who live in places where they either can't afford it or can't get it? A technology that provides great opportunity. The only question now is for whom? Cal Perry, NBC News. And coming up, battle at the beach. A town in Florida banning all umbrellas and tents on the sand. How some residents are fighting back to have it made in the shade. Back now with an unlikely controversy that's casting a shadow over a small town in Florida. A new law banning beach umbrellas is causing some local residents to seek legal action. Julie Serkin has the story. In Florida's smallest town, a big fight. Over shade, a controversial ordinance outlawing umbrellas and other, quote, temporary shade structures from the community's mile-long beach. The former mayor of a nearby town that shares the beach says it's all part of an effort to keep the public beach area exclusive to Bel Air Shore's wealthy residents. They don't want us there. For 75 years, residents here brought those typical beach day accessories along with them. Chairs, towels, and of course, cover from the hot sun. But in June of 2020, that all changed. Now, beachgoers like Pedro Rodero getting fined more than $100. I've never been in trouble, any kind of trouble. The culprit? His umbrella. This decision affects every coastline in the state of Florida. If Bel Air Shore is allowed to get away with this, then any city can do the same thing. Attorney Joseph Manzo moved to the Sunshine State several years ago, purchasing a home 100 yards from the coast, a major selling point in the area. But too much sun amid Florida's blistering summer heat is keeping the 63-year-old indoors. Now, focused on fighting back against the law. I mean, in your experience, why are they actually doing this? Well, initially, we had an influx of people after COVID. There was a lot of people who came out to the beach, not all Bel Air Beach residents, people from all over the state. The solution of Bel Air Shore was let's take away shade coverings. The UV index in this part of Florida climbs as high as 10 during summer months. With the sun that strong, there's an extremely high risk of harm without protection. That leaving 71-year-old Rodero to decide between a fun day at the beach. I've had cancer in my face. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, one spot that was taken off of my right uh, forehead was quite big. And without access to shade, potential health risks. The town now arguing that this is also being done because of the safety concerns umbrellas and other shade devices can pose. Just last month, a tragic accident involving a flying beach umbrella resulted in the death of a South Carolina woman. But Manzo says this is all about throwing shade. Why are they being so nasty? We're not your problem. You know, be, definitely patrol it to the people that are being nasty and trespassing, but don't harm the people that were really your good neighbors. Throwing shade. Nice. Julie Serkin. Uh, joins us now in studio. Thanks so much for joining Top Story. So what happens next in this beach battle? Yeah, we'll have to wait until the end of the month to find out because that's when Verdero is going to court to fight that ticket. But separately, the lawyer I spoke to told me that next February, they actually have a trial date set with 51 other people joining in his cause. So we'll have to see how this shakes out. For Tom Yamas, I'm Gabe Gutierrez in New York. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.